It's an interesting time to be alive. This is going to be just me discussing certain things that I've seen, mostly focusing on the Kyle Rittenhouse trial that's ongoing in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may be watching it. I suggest if you haven't, at least just take a pause and go to like DuckDuckGo on your Brave browser, open some kind of internet search, and just search for Kyle Rittenhouse, and you might get some imagery, you might see some content to just update you on it. But that is part of the interesting time that we have to be alive. It's the things that are going on. And time is essentially a measure of change. If something remains the same in a location or status, we say that it's timeless. It's just something that just remains that way. It's changeless. That's what we kind of say about these type of things. And many of you in passing have some understanding of how gravity is related to time. Just the whole idea like in space, depending on the amount of gravity you have on different planets and different locations, time is going to move in different ways. If you move fast enough in a certain location, your time is slower. That relativity that goes on with that, I think some of you are aware of it. It's, it's simple enough to be in blockbusters like Interstellar and people kind of get an inkling of what it is even if you don't know the actual details. But it's something you are aware of. You may also have heard of some form of the phrases grasping the gravity of the situation. You know, when they say something is really heavy, something is really dense, really intense, and somebody's acting in a flippant way, they don't understand the gravity of the situation. It's something that weighs you down. And then there's also this other phrase where they say, thoughts that lie heavily on me. You know, when something really, really intense happens, and there's this effect where time seems to slow down. And I've been going through something like that over the recent few weeks, this feeling like things are slowing down. Time is slowing down as I watch what's going on. And I spend a lot of time online, so I'm thinking some of it might just be a lot of time online, but something seems to be a little different about some of the things going on currently in current timeline. And I'm recording this on Sunday evening of November 14th of 2021. So in the future, when somebody else is listening to this, they can maybe look back to this date and see some of the things that were going on around this time, because I'm sure, I'm sure that there's a lot of other things I'm missing, because at these times when so much change is happening, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of all the other possibilities that are out there. I focus a lot on things in the United States of America, so that's, that's some of the things that I'm focusing on right now. And at the same time, due to the significance of all of these things happening, even if you pay attention to just a fraction of what is changing, it can inform you about all the other things that you don't, that you're not even aware of that are going on. Because things are going on whether you know it or not. Things have happened whether we know it or not. Things will happen in the future whether we expect them or not. That is a almost guarantee that we can expect. I mean, the world is going to end, even if you end, even if you end unfortunately, there's going to be other things going on. The universe shall go on without us, with or without us. So this Kyle Rittenhouse case, as I mentioned, take a pause, you can go check it, or just think about the things that you know about it. When was the first time you heard about this case? Is it in this video? Is this the first time you've heard it in this presentation? I don't think so. Chances are, if you're listening to this, you've probably heard it somewhere else, but I don't know. I personally heard of it on the actual day. I remember I was also still spending a lot of time online during the summer of 2020 when all these protests and riots and things like that were going on after the George Floyd situation which is another court case that was getting a lot of people watching it, and that was where Derek Chauvin had taken a knee on uh, George Floyd's neck, and in that whole process, George Floyd ended up dying, and, and after the court case, Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murder. And though the case was just relatively recent, right after that happened for that entire summer, there was a lot of protests and riots, the mostly peaceful riots and protests that have uh, been spoken of by other sources and other locations. During these mostly peaceful riots and mostly peaceful unrest and things like that, there was also an incident with Jacob Blake. This was an individual in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who during an incident where the police were called ended up being shot and injured, and this really led to some mostly peaceful, again, protests, mostly peaceful, occasionally fiery, burning down vehicles and breaking into things and whatnot in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And in one of those days following the Jacob Blake shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse was present and involved in a shooting that ended up with the death of two people. This is August 25th of 2020. That's when I first heard of Kyle Rittenhouse. On the days following, I went online to find as many videos and pictures and information that I could see from it. A lot of things were going around of what was being done, what was said, who was this person, who was dead, what was happening. And I remember seeing a lot of this footage at that time. Then in the following months, I followed some coverage on the actual case. I was following some people like Robert Barnes in specific, 
who was actually involved or knew some of the people involved in this, was in touch with the lawyers and was telling information about what was going on, what can be expected, what you can foresee. And then once the court case began, I've been following and seeing clips of that. And specifically, the last three days of the case when the defense had their witnesses up, including Kyle Rittenhouse going out and testifying, which is supposedly something that is unusual in this sort of trial to have the defendant actually go out and um, give his testimony. And then I also watched the last day, which was on Friday, which was the deliberation about the judge and the lawyers going over the lesser cases that might be given and the jury instructions that were going to be given once the closing arguments, which are upcoming on Monday. The Monday tomorrow, as I'm recording this, is going to be the closing arguments of that case. So I've been watching it. I think a lot more than the average person. So for whatever that matters to you, that's kind of my input and my <laughs> insight into it. I'm not a lawyer, I haven't studied the law. I've tried to look at data, look at information, look at sources, and that's how I'm coming up with it. So some of you might know more about these things and you might be more aware of it, but that's just a little bit of my background on it. I'm interested to know what your background on it before listening to this video has been before we go on. Just keep that in mind. Okay, and you don't have to watch any anything to have an opinion on it. I'm not that sort of person. No, you got to have an opinion. You got to have a lived experience. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think anyone can have something to say about it. Thoughts are thoughts. You can just be aware of something in passing. That's all you really need to have some thoughts on it. Once you're aware of something, it's in your mind and you form some thoughts on it. And some of your thoughts might be very useful, just having an inkling of an idea on it. And some people could have directly experienced something in a lived experience kind of sense, and they have pointless thoughts about it in part due to maybe trauma of the situation, seeing it from a certain angle, having some certain biases, having false information, false memories, and some people also just kind of lie. So that's kind of where I'm standing on it. I think anyone should have the right and ability to speak about it, but don't expect anybody to just act on your thoughts and opinions based off of that. Once you ask somebody else to participate into it, I think they're allowed to say, okay, before I do something based on what you say, could I have like some standards that you have to achieve before you convince me to do that? That's kind of where I'm standing on that. So let's continue with this. Problems occur due to how we define X rather than what X is. And in the Rittenhouse case, this stands out in many ways. In general, we know Rittenhouse was at a certain location with a certain weapon and shot at four certain people, injuring one, missing another, and two of those people that he did hit died. That is a known. I think those are just facts that we can all agree on. I think that's uncontroversial to say. That's just the basics of this. And I think, to me, personally, I saw this as a case of self-defense. Is this self-defense? Was it self-defense? Were the people who were being shot acting in self-defense? Was he acting in self-defense? I think if you see that, if you understand that, it makes things a lot more clear. But this is a little bit more subjective. Some people seem to think it's something else. Because I think most of the issues seem to come from disagreements of what the qualifications are for self-defense. Because I think most parties involved, in general, on all the sides of the argument, even the people involved in the actual case, have a general acknowledgement that someone has a right to defend themselves. I don't think that is something being necessarily argued that, oh, nobody should have a right to defend themselves. I think we can accept that's a thing that life forms have a right to. So what are the things about this particular case that are taking people away from this, that seem to make it hard for people to really just accept it that it is a self-defense kind of issue? One of the first things you can start with is if you are in a certain location and you're validly in that location, does that really involve your status of self-defense? So check this out. If a girl sneaks into a club and is assaulted by some men, do you say, well, she shouldn't have been there when you hear the news of it? Chances are you would not. And in part, I think this is part of the problem that's happening with a lot of these discussions. There's an X being discussed, but people want to bring in Y and talk about Z when X is the actual discussion here. When you talk about this court case, what is actually being discussed? What is the X? Let's define the actual X that is going on in the court case. So reminder, something that is legal does not necessarily need to be moral or ethical. The ongoing court case is strictly to come to a judgment on if the actions of Kyle Rittenhouse on August 25th of 2020 were legal according to the charges laid against him by the state, which were first degree reckless homicide with a dangerous weapon, first degree recklessly endangering safety with a dangerous weapon, 
First degree, intentional homicide with a dangerous weapon. Attempted first degree intentional homicide with a dangerous weapon. First degree recklessly endangering safety with a dangerous weapon. Possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under 18. And failure to comply with an emergency order from a state or local government. As you can see, some of the language is close, but with court cases, it's very specific to what is actually being charged. Like a reckless homicide is different than an intentional homicide. Both have the dangerous weapon in there. Possession of dangerous weapon by a person's under 18. That one is clear he was under 18. So is it considered a dangerous weapon in the actual laws and legal legalities of Kenosha, Wisconsin in that area? And the last one of the failures to comply with an emergency order from state or local government has been dropped and that was related to the ongoing mandates and different kind of uh, limitations on people being out that were in the curfews and things like that with the ongoing pestilence of unnamed origin, of unspoken of origin and things like that. And as I mentioned, I did watch the last day after the defense and the prosecution had presented their cases where there was deliberation, there's a consideration of adding some lesser charges into the whole case. Okay. So before getting more into the case, I shall go back to that initial example of somebody sneaking into a club. And let's see if your thoughts have changed from when I first mentioned it, and if your thinking will still be the same after I talk about this. So let's say this girl was 17. She stole a girl from her friend, and then had her father drive her hours across several state lines to go watch her favorite artist known to have rowdy shows. She gets to the location, and she sneaks in. While she's in there, she chooses to drink alcohol, which is illegal as she's under 21. She also takes some illegal drugs. She meets a few friends there and starts making friends with other people in the location. But she had several men during this time say aggressive things to her and the other people that she's with. But she still decides she's going to wander around on her own. She's a bit concerned. Oh, I've seen some of my people that I know and being assaulted. So she's just kind of walking around to see if she can help anyone. Because she's been at certain locations and knows you can be confused in these places. She's heard about negative things happening at these kind of shows. And she wants to be a bit responsible and just help people if they can be helped. So regardless, while she's doing this, some of those men that had been very aggressive towards her, had said some verbally aggressive things towards her, find her and they start chasing her down. She panics, pulls out a gun, one of them reaches for it, and then she ends up shooting three people and killing two people. In this situation, would this 17-year-old have had the right to defend herself? Does the fact that she crossed several state lines matter? Does it matter that the weapon she used was stolen? Does it matter that she had illegally imbued drugs before that situation? Does it matter that if earlier, when one of the people who were documenting the event decided to ask her what she was doing there, and she said, oh, you know, I'm just 19, I'm just here to just hang out with my friends and support them, you know, just keep safe if anything bad happens, we've seen some things happen, this, but this is a good time, we should just be having fun. Once she'd actually escaped this location and turned herself into the police, and information was coming out about this girl, would it matter if the men she shot were black, and you find that she had a history of saying the N-word, even outside just saying the lines of her favorite artists that she had come to see, like repeating the lines of that person's songs. Would that matter? It likely would not, unless you already had definitions of who she was as an X, or what the location or event as a Y is for, or the tools and items of Z involved are used to do. And that's what I'm saying. That's, again, those are the problems coming. Those are the things that are being defined. It's not just what the X is, but how we define those Xs, how other people define those Xs. And I think that's what's happening in this court case. An X is trying to be defined. And soon, there's going to be the end of the case. I don't know how many people have actually watched it. If you haven't yet, you can still go back and watch it. There's a lot of live streams and a lot of things out there where you can actually see the information for yourself. You can go and actually read the actual cases. You can read the case laws. You can read the things that he's charged for and things like that. There's a lot of, relatively a lot of evidence out there with it. We don't know how long it's going to take for the actual jury to de deliberate. I don't think he's going to be caught guilty on any of the actual cases from what I've seen and what I've known from all this time. But again, I might have some bias. But here are some things that I've seen in the general commentary that I think go to support this whole idea of problems occur not because of what X is, because of how we define X. So here's one thing. This is something I saw from Insider News. And they said, 
Jury selection in two of the most high-profile murder trials in the country, the Kyle Rittenhouse and Ahmaud Arbery cases, resulted in mostly white juries. Legal experts told Insider how this happened and why the jury selection system is imperfect. Now, I did not click this title because I think this is a bit of a clickbaity type of thing. Who are these legal experts? You can just kind of think. I was. This is my response. These are unserious people. Kyle Rittenhouse is white, and he shot whites in a mostly white country. And it's imperfect that, like the black Ahmad Aubrey situation, he was the one who was shot by other white people case, that the jury is overwhelmingly white. So what's the solution to this? Do they just want and say, like, every jury needs to be exactly like the population of the United States of America? Let's say it's not 12. Let's say they pick 20 and then you cut it down to the whole situation where you do a nomia a raffle. Like in the Rittenhouse case, they picked 18 jurors and then there's going to be a raffle after the closing arguments have been made, a raffle of sorts, to pick the final 12 that will deliberate on the actual cases. I mean, on the actual uh, charges. So let's say they had the initial one and say, okay, let's, let's make sure that out of the 20, we have to match the U.S. population. Is that what they're going to say? Or is it the population of the actual location, the demographics? What demographics are you going to choose? Does it have to be 50-50 male-female? If you're saying the entire nation, then should all juries only be limited to, okay, it's 14% is black population in the most wide kind of way you want to say it, black American, mostly black American. You can even add like the black Hispanics and things like that to get it up to maybe 20% or something like that. So do you want to make sure if there's 20 people picked for the initial one, only two of them have to be black at all times and three of them have to be Hispanic and you throw like one like, black, like uh, Asian person in there, whichever Asian you want to qualify for it. And then now it's supposed to be the rest of the 12. I think the 12 is the rest of the number left. Yeah, the 12 left are white people. Is that how it should be on every single court case? And then that you don't have the situation. It, doesn't, it looks representative of the nation. Who actually believes that? Very few people. I, I think anybody who actually believes that is not a serious person. That's why I'm saying these are unserious people. Now on to the next observation. This was by Ben & Jerry's, and yes, it's the Ben & Jerry's that makes the pints of ice cream and things like that. This is what they wrote. The Rittenhouse trial displays yet again that our justice, in quotation, system is racist. How would this trial be going if he was a black 17-year-old that crossed state lines illegally carrying an AR-15 and shot three white protesters? We need real justice in the legal system. This isn't it. <laughs> I, I, keep, I read this a couple of times, and can these people really be serious? First of all, why are they writing this now? They can't just wait for the end of the actual case to hear the closing arguments. They can't wait maybe the one week tops at most that the jury is going to take to actually have a situation where they actually deliberate and come guilty or not guilty on the charges. They can't wait for that. They're already saying it's done. Like, what is what is going on? There's, there's so much in this. It's just all over the place. Like, why, 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 why are they saying a black seventeen year old? Why aren't they saying a black seventeen year old shooting three black protesters? I, I'd imagine whoever wrote this might be the sort of kind of person to actually be at one of these protests. And have they actually realized that, hey, at most of these protests, I really don't really see that many black people. There's actually a lot of white people at these Black Lives Matter related protests. I guess these are the white allies. So they kind of realize that it would kind of be ridiculous to say, like, yes, I, a black kid went and shot black protesters at a location. They, they wouldn't really say that. Yeah, you can think of like the Chaz type of thing in um, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in uh, Seattle where black kids were shot dead. And have there been any arrests from that? I, if I'm not, I, I don't really remember any arrests coming from that. Well, regardless, they can say that so they could realize it's mostly white people. So it kind of makes more sense. If you go shoot people at these kind of protests, chances are even, it's, it's a mostly white country. So yes, but even on top of that, it's been mostly white people at these mostly peaceful protests. Or do they also realize that when blacks shoot other blacks, the coverage is not as high as this, let alone if they get caught in sentence. I mean, recently there was that situation in uh, California, I think, where there was a black student, a black 17-year-old from an upper middle class black family. He was supposedly getting bullied, and then the next day he actually took a gun and shot three people in school, including one of the, teacher, one of the teachers, and he was released like a few days after 
on bail, like $75,000 bail or something, and then Kyle Rittenhouse had been kept in jail for like a $2 million bail. Although allowed with Kyle Rittenhouse, people actually died in this situation with this 17-year-old, although it was a school. So that's kind of different. You think that's a little bit different. Don't quote me on those numbers. But there is that situation. And I would think it would be more preferable in the situation where you have the bail and have the people go out. I'm not saying this student should have been kept in jail for $2 million for as long as Kyle Rittenhouse says. No, I think Kyle Rittenhouse should have gotten the treatment that this other student had, this other kid had. That, that's kind of what I'm thinking is. So <laughs> another thing here, another thing, going back to this, this complete, just what is, what is, what is this, what is this document? What are Ben and Jerry's writing? Like, I'm thinking, are, are they trolling? Are they trolling? Is this people trolling these people? Because this is another thing that I've seen over and over again. Rittenhouse did not cross state lines with a weapon. Yes, he did drive. That weapon had been legally purchased and kept by his friend in Wisconsin. This is something that if you watch the court case, if you'd actually followed on the news before, this is information that was open and aware before the court case even started. So this person has not been watching the case or they've had a selective memory while watching the case. And it's like, what's going on with this person? Why are you, do why are you doing this? So him having a weapon is also not a reason to attack him because other people there had weapons. Hell, one of the people that he shot had a concealed weapon. And that person, Rosenkrantz or whatever, actually admitted that when he first actually was shot, it was after he pointed his pistol at Kyle Rittenhouse while Kyle Rittenhouse was on the ground after being hit by people, chased down by people. So what is wrong with this? Who, who, this, this person can't be watching the trial and say this, can they? Because that is a clear thing. Like, another thing, his mom did not drive him there. Kyle Rittenhouse worked in Kenosha, his father and friends live in Kenosha and is 30 minutes away from his mom's home where he's his primary residence. This is information that was made aware to me from watching footage and getting stories and information on the days after, like August 26th of 2020, I knew this information. So what's taking Ben and Jerry to still be writing this, all these other people out there? And they're talking about this crossing state lines thing. Imagine, and they're saying her, the mom should be held accountable. I do think parents should be held more accountable to the behavior of the minors where they still have some guardianship over. I think that's a positive thing, but that's not being held across the board. Because imagine if this was a supposed parent carrying several children illegally across several nations' borders into a supposedly country that is extremely racist towards those kids. What should be done to those parents in that situation? How accountable should those parents be? You find that's not something that's normally held in any kind of consistent manner. So on to a, another comment, and this comment... We're not saying much on this, but... <laughs> This just really bugged me, and this is by Tara Dublin. Now, again, this might be somebody who's trolling. It just seems like, why would somebody say something like this? <sighs> and they said, this was after Kyle Rittenhouse had been, on, had, had been on the stand, and he was first asked, this is when he was first asked about the first shooting of Rosenbaum, and he was telling what happened in that situation, and he ended up breaking down crying. And Tara Dublin decides to write... <laughs> After Kid Vicious had commented, I have zero sympathy for Kyle Rittenhouse. Black and Latino kids have been imprisoned and killed just for the color of their skin. He killed people. And he's pointing at the image of Kyle Rittenhouse in, in his story, right? And then Tara Dublin adds to that, I guess, I mean, been in prison and killed just for the color of the skin. We have no evidence actually given. That's an assertion that you can make. I'm sure it might have possibly happened just for the color of the skin. They just picked up off the road. You have that skin color, we're putting you in. Nothing else that you did, we're just putting you in. That, that could have happened. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. But Tara Dublin decides to add to that and says, and that's the same face Kyle Rittenhouse will make during his first time in the prison shower. Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty. So this had its amount of likes. It made the rounds. Other people were, were mocking her and the things, the things she said in the past that are also kind of odd, but this is a typical type of thing. There was this, um, something like Defiant L's or something like that. There's, a, there's an account that, that posts L's of people and it, it shows an image of something they tweeted earlier than something they recently tweeted. It's a good account. You should check it out if you're on Twitter. Okay, so some of the people that legitimized that literally shaking due to a meme that triggered PTSD based on words that a stranger said about something that other people said to someone else in the past will now mock Rittenhouse, claiming that he was faking it rather than suffering mental anguish. That's the kind of thing that some of these people do. So that's why I'm wondering, with some of these people, I think in general people are good, but what are they defining in this situation? They must just have certain, the people who truly believe this must just have a certain idea of who Kyle Rittenhouse is ahead of time. Understand that he's guilty. Guilty of what? Which cases is he guilty of? Did he shoot and end up killing people? Yes, I'm not denying that. But was that a good shoot? Was it self-defense? 
If so, then he is not guilty of manslaughter. There's a difference. He is guilty of killing people. He is guilty of having a rifle. He is guilty of firing that many times at people. But is that a legally accepted thing in the rules of law? And somebody else came and commented on this. People who I post on this in one of my social media outlets or platforms or portals were saying, yeah, this is kind of ridiculous. This is kind of disgusting. And then somebody else came and was like, ha ha, yeah, well, he's guilty. That's what's going to happen. And they checked this person's profile. They happen to be a homosexual person. At least they were dating somebody who seemed to appear to be both males dating each other. And I said, yeah, that's kind of weird that you are first of all saying that somebody deserves to be subjected to unwilling homosexuality because they kill somebody? Is this what this person is saying? It's like, oh, no, well, he's going to go to jail anyway. And there's something else that somehow him as a homosexual person, just the, the world in general, seems to accept that they seem to subconsciously recognize that there actually is a forcible sexual intercourse actions culture in male jails involving males assaulting other males. Yet we talk about how there's all this this sort of culture in all sorts of other places. So, listen, there's no argument to me that the current prison system in the USA and all over the world could probably use a lot of reform. There's some locations I'm like, ah, that's a bit, not, yeah, really, yeah, really I really help you anything. And some other locations I'm like, yeah, you guys are just completely creating a worse issue. Like, the way it currently is, it's so intertwined with the state that any stated goals are unlikely to be achieved. And this is in large part due to the fact that it's formed a symbiotic relationship in keeping crime at certain levels where there'll be constantly prisoners to come in. And then when the prisoners come in, the state can pay them and they can get like state funding and things like that, government funding, in order to keep those jails open at a certain level and productive. So they have that aspect of it. That's what the so-called private sector of this whole jail prison industrial complex has it. Prison incarceration complex has it with that kind of thing. And they also go in there, they put criminals in there and train the criminals. The criminals come out and they have recid recidivism, which is the thing of somebody commits a crime, then commits more crimes and comes back in. There's a whole situation where majority of criminals come from single mother households. It does not necessarily mean it, violent criminals. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who has a single mother ho household will be a violent criminal, but there seems to be a propensity of that in there. So that's something that is not really discussed that much. And on the other end, the state benefits by this kind of system of these people coming out of the recidivism and they're kind of known factors once they've been in the system. You've been systemized. Once you enter the juvie type of thing, you're in the system and chances are they can kind of just track you and expect that these people, we can kind of follow them and they'll probably keep doing certain criminal things and we keep them in there and then the community keeps a level of fear of criminality awareness that they'll keep saying, yeah, we need the states to be there with the security system. We need the police to be funded. We need them in our lives. We need these big government to come and help these kids because we're not could help them. So there's a kind of system, that kind of knowledge, there's, there's a kind of frustration I see with this. So yeah, that system can be fixed. But to talk about this, some people are like, oh yeah, we have no problem. They don't really have a problem with the system of jail as is. They just have issues, supposed issue with who is in jail. That's the primary issue with a lot of people who are anti-prison. I'm just anti the system as is. I think it needs, it needs, I don't want to say it needs to be like completely shut down something else new, but we need something different. We can do better. And some of those do better things is private sector, private individuals going out to do more. And as I mentioned, with the whole situation with kids of single parents having some negative results, there's also a lot of them that have positive results. Like you have LeBron James. You have someone like LeBron James who also goes around and he's like, I'm going to help the kids. I'm going to do more for kids in the community. He opens a school. He does all these things. He's more than an athlete. He's somebody, an example to show that you don't have to get married up in this. You can become a multi... Is he a billionaire by now? He's, he's close. You can become a multi-millionaire, one of the best people, whatever you chose to do in your life. Another thing LeBron James does is he tweets. And LeBron James came out and he said this tweet. This was with the same in the image of Kyle Rittenhouse crying with the U.S. Today type of uh, story that was being posted. It said Kyle Rittenhouse broke down in tears. His murder trial went on the witness stand and he described the events of August 25th of 2020 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And LeBron James came out and he said, what tears? I don't see one. Man, knock it off. That boy ate some lemon heads before walking into court. And then he had like a couple of uh, laughy faces. And yet, there have been some memes in this. There have been some funny things in this. But this is LeBron James, one of the most famous people in the United States of America. Somebody that came out and said that, you know, he's, uh, some time back, this was in uh, 2020, October 2020, it's a story here. Uh, this was after the whole situation with Jacob Blake. This was after the situation with, um, with um, George Floyd and him talking about issues. And he says, okay, this is something that he was, he was doing a press conference in the NBA. He told, he told some reporters, 
It's a scary thought right now. You think that if my son gets pulled over, said James, and you tell your kids, if you just comply and you just listen to the police, that they will be respectful and things will work itself out. You see these videos that continue to come out, James said. It's a scary-ass situation that if my son calls me and says that he's been pulled over, that I'm not confident that things are going to go well and my son is going to come home. So this is what LeBron James says. This is what he thinks. He thinks about the danger out there as a parent, what happens to the kids. But he's a parent right here, 17-year-old kid that was involved in this, and then he comes out and says this. And I think this is a human thing. Like, LeBron James is a basketball player. He's the basketball player. He's one of the best basketball players to ever play in the world. And I don't think this should reduce his importance. I saw somebody else post and say, okay, my kid idolizes him. Like, then he says this, what should I say? I'm like, what does that involve? Like, your kid doesn't idolize him for anything else but basketball, right? They were like, yeah, it's basketball. Well, he's still an amazing basketball player. Like, if you have a kid at any age, I think this is a good example to say, look... He's amazing at this because he put his interest and, and he's invested time in this and he knows about this. And you should praise him for this. You should be admired for his dedication to a chosen pursuit. But you can also do that and be completely zero at other important things. On some aspects, he's more than an athlete, but at other aspects, he's much less than an athlete. And that's a human thing. And if you are looking at to LeBron James for any, for any sort of moral leadership or general social issues and you're not his kids or his direct friends and family, then that's a personal issue on you. You shouldn't be looking to LeBron James and other people with that. You should find that on your own or other people in your direct life. And if you're missing that out, that's an unfortunate thing, but you can find other people to do that. So to wind this out, I think we are approaching a time when there can really be more actual social justice, genuine social justice, as in societies that have a level of justice that we can all agree on to a general amount. And we are diverse. Societies will continue to be diverse because the individuals within that are genuinely diverse. So we will continue to have different definitions and perspectives about certain things. But I think we can all agree and we can all support this increase in public access to evidence of the actual judicial process. Why some seem to just want to comment without actually watching is kind of odd to me. I understand someone like LeBron James. He has a lot of things going on. I think the NBA season is going on. He's involved in all these things. He's got new teammates and all these other things. He's got all these projects outside and things like this. So why does he feel the need to just come out and troll him and, and troll Kyle Rittenhouse in this kind of sense? I, I don't know. Wh whatever, LeBron. Okay, these other people would decide they have to do that. Whatever. That's, that's something that people do. And I think people wrongly feel that it's their duty to make certain social political declarations because you're told, oh, you, as, a, as a responsible citizen and a voter and these things, you're supposed to be aware of these kind of things. But think about, for example, think about how some people are mocked for commenting on movies without having actually watched them. Saying like some basketball team, like a basketball team should have done X, Y, Z without even having played basketball or been a fan of the sport. People would mock you for saying that. But when it comes to social political issues... The claim that X people should be told by Y government dictate to provide Z service without being any of those X people or caring how Y dictate will be enforced or opting out of ever using Z service is a common thing. It's something that people are actually praised for doing. Why? Why? Why is this? Like, why don't others go and take the time to actually watch any of the hours of footage available the day after the shooting like I did? I know millions of other people did. I've seen people actually come out and say, like, oh, I was just completely unaware of this. I had these certain opinions about these things in the past, but I just haven't done this. I get people have other jobs and other things like that. And I spent a lot, like I said, I spent a lot of time online. But still, if there's a lot of things I just don't speak about, because even though I spend a lot of time online, I know that I spent a lot of time online learning about these things and have missed all these other things. So I'm not anywhere close to actually being able to speak on these other things. Yet people still <laughs> do this. It's just, I, I, don't, I don't understand why people are doing this. The, the footage is available. Millions of people did watch this footage. Like Rittenhouse being there as a medic was known to me as there were clips of him cleaning graffiti. They were doing nonviolent things, going around talking about being like helping out a medic. Like he had the medic, but this was, this was sort of known information. It's been known information. Why does the FBI have this drone footage and keep it hidden? You know, I'm kind of wondering, if they had this footage, if they'd been doing this for Kenosha and other than mostly peaceful kind of protests that were happening, may they have some identities of other people from the riots and potential criminals 
that they just don't feel a certain need to share it. There's, there's some questions with it. Like, I wonder why they were so apprehensive with releasing it. They said some of the HD footage had been lost and it was like refound it sometimes. So there's these kind of questions. I know there's other people, like that third, that there was an individual that did a jump kick at Kyle Rittenhouse. It hasn't even been found. The FBI might know who that person is. There might be footage of him in that thing. How come that's not being released? So that's, I, I understand there's certain information that's not present. There are situations in the past where there was just no information. Nobody had the ability to actually catalog some of these things. But recently, you have this. Part of the reason the George Floyd issue became this big, became international, was because there was people with, with this cell phones filming the entire nine minutes of it. That was easily found. But then there was also information from inside the store where he gave the fake uh, bill. There was also information about the from the body cam footage, some footage of the actual initial uh, traffic stop and things like that. So there's other footage out there that you could search out more. But once you actually watch the trial, you see that information. So here with the Rittenhouse, I get there might be some people that might not have actually seen the information. I, I get that. People have things in their life. I get randoms not understanding that. I even get that people might not have known that the people with Kyle Rittenhouse shot were white. I kind of get that. But... <laughs> Why, why declare that ticket? But when it comes down to people like in the news, Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks, when they came out, they claimed to be a news channel, a news reporter. And then you say details matter in this talk that she came on. saying so, you know, details matter. And they're coming out, like with the Rittenhouse case, I, I was thinking that Kyle Rittenhouse had chased down Rosenbaum. And she said, you know, I'm just showing you evidence now to show you because details matter, facts matter, that he wasn't chased. How did she actually not know this? She had repeated shows to supposedly millions of viewers of hers saying that Kyle Rittenhouse had chased this person down. So when you have these people out there going out with disinformation, disinforming people, misinforming people, what, what is this? That just seems, to me, this just seems like some people are starting to hedge their bets for the oncoming civil suits for defamation and more that are coming from Kyle Rittenhouse, because that's most definitely going to happen from how I see this case going. I don't think he's going to be caught guilty on these major cases, on these major charges that I've seen here. Now, we'll see what happens. It's always a crapshoot when you have this kind of situation. They also could be a dismissal because, in specific, there was a certain violation of a constitutional right when the lawyer was asking Kyle Rittenhouse how come Kyle Rittenhouse hadn't come out and told his actual story before he had taken counsel. And due to some 40-year-old or so uh, statute in the legal system in the United States, a federal statute, you're not supposed to bring up or call into question somebody's right to um, to retain counsel and just rights to remain silent. That is one of the many possible violations that are brought here that they can be a mistrial with prejudice. And if this happens, that's a situation where if you've been mistried with prejudice, which means something the prosecutor did or somebody did something that violated the sanctity of that proceeding, you cannot actually retry that case. If it's just a mistrial, the same charges can be re can be brought up again because you can say that it might have been just something that happened wrong outside of the control of the primary parties in there. So that can still come up. So that's just one of the potential things that might happen. I don't know. I... <laughs> I've been following this, as I mentioned, this is one of the things that I think has been slowing time down for me. I don't know if you've kind of noticed this time slowing thing. There's happening, things happening with Russia, collusion type of thing. There's things happening with Project Veritas. There's things happening with the Bidens. There's things happening with COP19 or 29 or 26 or whatever it is. There's just other things that have been happening with the, with the whole like pestilence. There's a lot of things going on in the United States of America that affect the rest of, I think, the, the, the world in, in other ways. We're, we're all connected in some kind of way. And this information we have, I think there is something with this information, with this the gravity of knowledge, knowing certain things. Think about what you knew about the Rittenhouse trial before you listened to this video, before you've watched the actual court case, before you actually heard anything else. When was the first time you heard that this wasn't a racist white person going out and gunning down black people? When was the first time you actually knew this information? Ask yourself, why were you getting this information from certain locations? What stopped you from going out and finding this information that isn't readily available before this court case? Why are you stating certain things right now without actually watching the court case? Now, with this, there's many other things that you are probably in the same situation. There's many things that I am in this situation with where I make up my mind and talk about certain things without actually looking it up. Now, if I'm online and I just have like a passing question, like I was just listening to this, watching, reading this manga, and I was like, oh, this kind of glue that comes from this kind of tree and then it's used to make golf balls. It's like, really? Then I end up and actually going out and just doing a quick look and just found it like we got that information. So it's just, we live in this time when there's an information age. We can get all sorts of information. And I think with this access to information, it's exponential. Where some information that some people have holds them down in the situation and slows time down for them. Yet I think with some information, 
by you not actually having made the decision, the gravity of not deciding to attain knowledge that's available to you can slow time down for you, can keep you in the past, can keep you locked in a certain paradigm, whereas other people are just time traveling to an infinite future that's likely much better than where you are by choosing to get certain information, certain facts about the world. And I think that is something that I encourage you all out there. Thank you all very much for first of all coming out to listen to this. On the, on the screen, if you're watching the video version of this, there will be a speed drawing I did of the Doe series that I've had with like Kyle Rittenhouse and different things. To post this on a merchandise store, I'll probably have to censor the rifle and the weapon, but might do that, might not. Not quite sure. I might just post it and see what it says. It was probably going to get knocked down if I actually post it on the red bubble, which I normally post it. But this is something that I've been following sometimes, so seeing it unwind. There's many things, other things that I've been following, getting certain information, and things have been coming out as like, wait, yeah, I kind of knew this. And there's this risk where I've mistrusted some things that I've thought I knew of at some time, and then after some time it comes out to be unveiled, and I need to act more on these things. But why do you act on certain things? Why do you mistrust certain things? Why do you trust certain things? And why do you actually act on certain things before actually getting certain levels of evidence? Has that changed for you? Has your opinion about this changed? Just ask yourself again, how many people were completely in support or saying certain things about this specific trial? How many people are now going to act and admit that, hey, they were wrong about this? I saw there was another really good uh, response that was making the rounds where somebody said they are somebody who they consider themselves relatively well-educated, relatively well-skeptical, or they researched certain things, but they had just taken this for granted that Kyle was a racist person, was involving black people, and they had a kind of awakening of sorts where they're realizing there's a lot of squirrely, propaganda-y type of things that people say things. Admit, you got to agree, people lie. We lie a lot. By definition, in-groups are defined by the lies that you tell each other rather than the truths. Because if it's just true, if you could just say, yeah, Kyle Rittenhouse was there, he didn't cross state lines, his white people who were kind of assaulted him, some of those people that he shot were actually previously had been accused of, uh, you know, assaulting children in in sexual ways and things like this, and he was a mental patient, and he was, like, dropping the N-word and things like Because, like, that's the kind of thing, like, when the lawyer, when the prosecutor lawyer, Binger, first said that in the opening statement or something like that, he was like, huh? People are shocked. I can't believe he said it. But, yeah, he was just repeating what somebody said. And, you know, people were like, okay, he's repeating what somebody said, but he's obviously repeating what a, what a black person said. No. He was repeating what Rosenbaum, who by people say, I guess if George, if George Zimmerman is a white Hispanic, you could say he's like a white Jew, had said, had yelled, shoot me, N-word, shoot me, N-word. He'd said that several times to Kyle Rittenhouse and other people with guns. This person was not a stable person. If you'd known this before, would you just think by that narrative? But this woman, I think she identifies as a woman, had came out and said that. And this is not exclusively to her. This is in part also because there's been so many things coming together, coming together at, the, at, at one time. People are starting to wake up and say, okay, we're questioning why are these people in these in-groups telling their things? And you can see the people in the in-groups are still saying, well, you know, this is racist. Like, as I mentioned in some of these comments, why is Ben and Jerry saying that? What is the point of saying that? Why is LeBron James choosing this to speak on? The recent thing that LeBron James had spoken on was that situation where there was a 16-year-old or so girl at some kind of foster home and things like that, and she was assaulting some other people, and the cop came, and she was trying to stab somebody else, and then she ended up actually being shot, and she died, and he came out and was like, oh, you're next, or something like that, with a picture of the white policeman that had involved in that. Then if he had just waited 24 to 48 hours to actually see the actual footage of it, you'd have seen that this 16-year-old large, rather large female was trying to stab somebody and then was shot. I mean, you can kind of see that and just wait. Why does LeBron James feel the need to signal about this? But at the same point, he's like, okay, I'm not going to talk about the China situation. I'm going to hold back with the China. I'm not really quite aware of that, but you're going to speak on this. If he says this is my back hair and things, he's not from Kenosha. He's not from Wisconsin. It's not involving black people because he's talking about his people. So what is he talking about? Why, why did he feel the need to do this? Why did Tara Dublin feel the need to talk about this whole prison shower like situation? Why, why, why does Ben and Jerry's feel the need to talk about this? What's, what's the point? I don't understand why these in-group people are just going back and doubling down on some of these situations. <sighs> and <laughs> that, that, that's, 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 that's it for me on this one. Uh, it's been something I've been watching. I might do a follow-up later on once the actual case gets resolved and things like that. Unlikely. I have a lot of other content, a lot of other things, and a lot of other projects and ideas that I want to go forward on and increase this ability of just talking about actual issues and having conversations, having communications, get into the situation where before we talk about certain very serious situations that I think we benefit society and all the 
the earth benefits from talking about some of these things instead of getting caught back in the past and thinking we are living in the past when we couldn't understand each other, we couldn't communicate with each other, we couldn't come to an actual agreement on certain topics that if we agree on, we can build a future on. Instead of getting caught in this, let's actually get to a point where we have some kind of age of understanding. And I think I want to take part of that. I want to be a part of that in some kind of way. And thank you all for coming and listening to this. Let me know what you thought about this in the comment section where you listen to this. There'll be more content coming. There's already other content available wherever you listen to this about it. And again, just take your time if this is something that's important to you. I'll be watching the closing uh, arguments. And I, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm, that's, that's it for now. Thank you all very much. Oh, just one more thing. I was thinking I could go back in and try to splice this in somewhere, but oh, it's just another observation with something that I have observed for some time that yet again I'm seeing other people starting to observe is the cases that are picked. Bad things do happen to good people. That is a thing that definitely, most definitely does happen. No argument from me on this one. The police forces are enforcement agents enforcing laws of the state they enforce the laws of the state. They're not there to keep you safe. They're there to enforce laws of the state, which is defined by its monopoly of legal violence over any given area and people. That's what they do. So I understand there's going to be issues with any institution that is so how, that is such situated, that is made up in this kind of way. So with this accepted, why is it that the cases that the people seem to, certain people seem to come up and advocate for and, and surround just involve such questionable people and situations? Like with the Jack, Jacob Blake situation, he had a warrant for his arrest in July. Now you can say, okay, that July, what was that warrant for? It was based on third degree sexual assault, trespassing and disorderly conduct in connection to domestic abuse. His girlfriend and other people called because he was in there taking kids away from them. There were some situations that that's what had happened with Jacob Blake in that situation. Yet this was the person that they decided to come up and say, this is somebody we're going to stand up for. George Floyd, as I mentioned before, would people go out and say, well, he shouldn't have been there giving a fake bill? No, nobody really says that because so what with the fake bill? He still actually went there. That's, again, enforcement. He was called to enforce the laws that the state has a monopoly in making the currency and this person was violating that and he was brought there and part of the whole fentanyl situation and he swallowed the fentanyl, the situation where that drug was legal. I think it should be legal for people to take drugs. He's an adult. Let him take all kinds of drugs if he wants. I think it should be legal to have other sorts of currency besides like the dollar. Eh, that might get me like fine. I might, get, I might never get back in the United States of America or say stuff like that. But regardless, so there was things in there. There's certain laws that set this up. But then George Floyd himself has also had a check it passed. Now you're going to say that past has nothing to do with this situation. Jacob Blake's past has nothing to do with this situation. But here with Kyle Rittenhouse, like, oh, well, in the past, you know, he did this, or in the past, he did that, or he had a, he had a profile where he said this, and he knows these kind of people, and he did this and that in the past. The, the lack of consistency with these things, the fact that people are still bringing up the hands up, don't shoot thing with the Michael Brown notes, proven to be a false situation. The fact that you still have to go back to the George Zimmerman, the white Hispanic with Trayvon Martin, like, oh, that's going to happen, you know, Trayvon wouldn't have been treated in this kind of way. You have a situation with this 17-year-old boy. You have that kind of situation with this. Why do people need to go back to such jumps in time if this is such a frequent sign of how horrible the United States of America is? How horrible, how pro-white the America is? You say, oh, this is the sign of a white person being protected. Now with the current pestilence, I've been looking and saying, hey, you know these pharmaceutical companies, they are mostly run by white people who have been making billions of dollars. Yet they are indemnified by this justice system that you're saying it should be a mandate for people to go out there and get that jab in their arm, put it in their arm and things like this. They're indemnified. So is this the system that you're saying, oh yeah, it's protecting white people, including Kyle Rittenhouse and the people running these pharmaceutical companies? Is, it, is, that, is that the kind of thing that y'all are saying? I, I, I don't know what's going on. So with this situation, why is it that people seem to pick such questionable situations to actually back? Here, people are backing, talking about these are heroes or should remember the people. As I mentioned, one of them had literally been caught, been guilty of abusing children in a sexual manner. Had literally been there talking about, shoot me in, shoot me in. And this is someone people seem to be rallying around. Grosenkrauts, who was shot in the bicep right after, was supposedly his best friend, said, said uh, yeah, he, he said he, was, he regretted not having an empty this clip into Kyle Rittenhouse, and then now that best friend came out in the court and said, oh, no, I was just lying about that, I was making that up. So 
People lie. We don't know which one is true and which one is not. People talk about, oh, the police are horrible people. They're never there to actually do what they're supposed to do. This person goes out to kind of protect the Kyle Rittenhouse situation. He goes out to protect and it's like, oh, you Kyle Rittenhouse shouldn't be there. That should be left to the police. Who should be left to do that? It's like, okay, private properties is the thing. We're completely commies. So you shouldn't be protecting any kind of situation. Is that what they're talking about in this? When Kyle Rittenhouse goes to the cops and he actually was trying to raise his hand and they're like, look, we're dealing with this unrest. You can't go there. So you have to go away and then you can come and like actually submit yourself to the police later on and say, oh, how come the cops didn't treat him? If he was black and he was walking with his weapon up, they would have shot him. Really? Again, as I mentioned, the hands up, don't shoot thing and Michael Brown thing has been proven to not have been what happened. I am glad that cops don't shoot people with just their hands up, even if that person seems to have a weapon on them. I am glad Kyle Rittenhouse did not fire until the gun was pointed towards him by Grosenkrantz. I'm glad that child as well who went to his high school with a weapon the day after he was supposedly bullied and shot people wasn't just shot by the police when he was walking out if he had been walking out with his hands up even if he had a weapon on his self i'm glad these things don't happen but seem people seem to be upset that kyle rittenhouse wasn't shot dead by the police it's it's, do you want the police to shoot people dead without being a direct threat to the police or do you want them to not i I don't understand why some people are coming from in this, and it's somewhat frustrating, but we are going to have an actual resolution to this case soon, and there will be some fireworks coming from it. I don't think it will be anywhere as close to the level of protests that we're seeing. I don't think people in Kenosha will actually get up in this in the same situation we're talking about cross state lines. They don't talk about the crossing state lines of the people who were shot and the other people who were in that location. Was everybody there who was shot from Kenosha? No. They crossed state lines too. But this some of them, some of them crossed state lines, some of them came from other places in Wisconsin. But it's 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 it's, it's the way it is. So that's that's the end of this little addendum is a set of world follow-ups. So there's some extra thoughts and things that I wasn't shoehorned somewhere into the actual thing that I talked about here. But I've been uh, rambling on for enough. And these are my thoughts on this. And we'll see. I think uh, depending what happens after, if there's big, big kind of protests and things like that, I might come out and talk a bit more after this. But I, I, I don't think it's that necessary in this specific topic. But this is related to a lot of other things I talk about and think about. And some of those time slowy type of things, once I start parsing those out and making sense of it, I'll probably touch on this again later. Okay, now goodbye for real, please.